The board, on the other hand, is protected by a uh, one key fits all lock. <laughs> And uh, this is standard practice, as you can see. And like everything else on the internet, they're easily available to add to cart. And you can get keys for pretty much every major vendor. So one key, say, f uh, will open all the models from that same manufacturer, the cabinet. Now, funnily enough, the debug keys used to be available last year, um, but they've somehow vanished. <laughs> I'm sure of a little creativity, they can still be acquired. Uh, so now with your master key you have access to the USB slots and whatever other inputs. So you can pop open the motherboard compartment, insert a USB key within a couple of seconds. Uh, it's a lot faster than installing a skimmer of course. Now even though the attack time here is short, of course it's still the possibility for detection. But that's the great thing about these retail and standalone type ATMs. You know, they're, they're in bars, they're out by the restrooms, out of sight, off by the Siggy machine or something. But then there's also kind of the psychological aspect of ATMs. It's, you know, it's considered kind of rude to look over the shoulder of someone as they're using the ATM. Unless you're of course a criminal and if he was looking over my shoulder, well he would learn a trick or two I suppose. <laughs> now all ATMs need ways to upgrade the firmware and this is most often leveraged via the removable drives. So the ATM application will check the drive for a valid upgrade, a valid firmware is found, um, it will load it up, install, and upgrade the device and of course we can install, install whatever code we want to. Now of course the firmware is typically a proprietary uh, format. Executables encapsulate in the firmware, there are checksums and encryption. But these algorithms are easily figured out by reverse engineering the code on the ATM side. So once you can create your own firmware package it has the correct format where you can then upgrade but of course with a few modifications. Now the remote attack, um, which is obviously the most important vector, so most, if not all ATMs are running some sort of Windows based OS support some form of remote monitoring and remote configuration. So this allows you to log into your ATM remotely, review or change your settings, get stats, change splash screens and so on. But another useful feature is the ability to remotely upgrade the software. <laughs> now this is sometimes a feature but it's always something you can leverage if you have a vulnerability, right? Now obviously authentication is required to be able to do anything remotely. And this particular model, you require both a serial number and a password, and they're both made up of a combination of numbers and letters. Five second delay is forced after each connection attempt, so a brute force is basically out of the question. So we require a vulnerability within the authentication process itself, and it just so happens. So introducing Dillinger. Dillinger is my uh, remote ATM attack or administration tool, whatever way you want to look at it. So we've talked about loading code locally on an ATM machine uh, with the master key and the flash drive and the correctly formed firmware you're basically set. But the obvious drawback here is that you need to interact with the machine in some way. So of course the ultimate win is to be able to execute code or load software remotely and that's where Dillinger comes in. Named after the uh, bank robber of course. So, uh, so Dillinger takes advantage of a fairly serious vulnerability in the ATM remote management capability. And interestingly, although most operators don't actually use this capability, remote monitoring is enabled by default <laughs> on all of this manufacturer's ATMs. So, cha -ching. Now, typically to log into the machine remotely will requ require both knowledge of the serial number and of the password. Now, due to a pretty awesome vulnerability, I'm able to bypass all authentication on the device and the remote attack is 100% reliable. Now Dillinger supports both TCP IP and it also supports dial-up because uh, I heard through a fairly knowledgeable source that approximately 95% of these standalone type ATMs are using a dial-up connection. So of course back in the day trying to find an ATM over the phone line would be a long process of nights and nights of war dialing but thanks to tools like uh, HD Moore's Warbox, you can map out modems on exchange in a matter of hours and then just write a custom tool to find ATMs and you're away. So Dillinger allows you to manage an unlimited amount of ATMs through its interface. So you could, you know, add a group, say a city, under this city you can add each individual ATM that you found and either its IP address or its phone number. Now the heart of the tool of course is the authentication bypass which is the stepping stone to doing anything useful really. So one feature in Dillinger is to be able to test the bypass in a way which confirms the vulnerability but doesn't actually modify uh, the remote system or leave any trace. So the obvious problem with finding a remote ATM is that you have no idea of the location. So I've added a feature which can pull the ATM settings which includes all the master passwords um, 
and the receipt data, because you know each time you use an ATM, you look at the bottom of the receipt, has the location of where it is, or at least the name of the business, right? Um, upload a rootkit, so that's not really, uh, that's not a bad feature. Bypasses authentication, initiates the software upload, which lets me replace the firmware, so awesome. Uh, so in general, someone's going to need to be at the ATM if you want to get a payout, right? So I've had another feature, so it'll be possible to carry out an attack without ever visiting the ATM. When someone inserts a card, that track data is captured, and I can retrieve that track data remotely. And finally, the remote jackpot, which I suppose speaks for itself, really. Now, introducing Scrooge. Scrooge is the uh, rootkit I've developed specifically for ATMs. Implements uh, typical rootkit technologies, uh, hides itself by various C system calls, hooks, uh, hides itself from the process list, hides itself from the file system, hooking syscalls, filtering the results, and so on. Now, there's a hidden pop up menu which can be activated with both a special key sequence on the ATM or inserting a card that has some custom track data on it. It'll run on any ARM or X-scale based ATM, Intel with a few tweaks. Uh, originally it was designed for both Intel and ARM, but it turns out that CE on x86 is actually pretty rare, and basically non-existent in the ATM world. Uh, so the code for interfacing with the ATMs has to be customized for different ATMs, as they all use different peripherals and fairly non-stated protocols for communicating. Um, so I just use a, sta a standard set windows hook for capturing the side buttons on the ATM and although that's, the API is actually undocumented in Windows CE, it still exists and it works as expected. So a combination of keys will trigger the, the menu. It's varied enough not to launch by accident but you know if maybe some kid's screwing around with it he might get a big payout but who knows. Uh, the card reader is hooked via an inline detour style patch so essentially where you patch in a branch instruction to a piece of code you'd like to intercept. The branch jumps your code your code executes and then returns the original function. Now with the hook in place is a check on the read buffer any time a card is entered and if the second track matches gimme the loot, um, it will bring up the menu as well. So the menu functions are fairly standard for what you'd expect. You can dispense from each cassette, print out stats uh, which includes remaining bill count and of course exit. Uh, so to add my own functionality I've added a few inline patches where basically if you know, patching a few assembler stubs of the functions you want to hook. That stub calls functions in external DLL and executes any overwritten instructions and continues as normal. So this could be done dynamically, but the fact that these specific ATM vulnerabilities allow me to replace the entire firmware and the enti all the different executables, uh, I can make these patches permanent, which is far more reliable. And it's also a lot easier on ARM as every instruction is 32 bits long. So I place hooks at the card reader, the pin pad, and the parser that handles the remote configuration commands. So with those hooks, we can add some fairly handy features, save the track data, capture the pin pad, add in a few custom remote commands. So get the track data remotely, sure, remote jackpot, you know, might as well. So I blitz through these because there's a fair few demos I need to get through. So I may as well put my money where my mouth is now, I suppose. I guess there's a pun there somewhere. Actually, let's start with the remote stuff first. Okay, so we can start by adding a group. Hold on, let me get this sort of thing sorted. So we'll make the uh, the group DEFCON. Can now add an ATM. My ATM. Uh, location, I guess, would be on stage at DEFCON. <laughs> And so even though I support both modem TCP IP, I just have this wired, um, wired over crossover cable just for the ease of demonstration, really.
Okay, so, um, of course I can test the bypass, which is important. This will allow me to ensure that the authentication bypass actually exists, but won't modify anything on the system. So I'm going to attempt connection, connected, testing ATM, ATM authentication bypass, success. Now if you just want to quickly flick over to the ATM there and get that on screen, is that possible? So all that's all that's shown on the ATM is that RMS process is just is RMS process basically. And that's all that's seen. Okay. Now let's uh, go back to the computer now, please. Now, of course, the uh, the best is to be able to upload the rootkit, which will leverage that same authentication bypass to get there. And I just going to reiterate that this is default on every single one of these ATMs. So I'll upload the final version of Scrooge. Connects, sends the authentication bypass, success, initializes the software upload, and now Scrooge is actually uploading to the ATM. Uh, that port is just default. That, what, say again? No, I mean that's that's the, that's the port that they specify in the manual, which um, interestingly enough can't be changed either. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, if we could flip back to the ATM now. So basically, once a rootkit's been uploaded, the ATM should reboot. Uh, it just says RMS process. So it, it realizes someone's uh, managing the ATM. They just don't realize that, uh, <laughs> that it's not legitimate, I suppose. There you go. So the rootkit got uploaded. The ATM's rebooting. So now as it boots up, it should. Um, it should have my rootkit surreptitiously running in the background. Okay. Just let me know when that uh, boots back up. Oh, uh, Tried to cover the vendor's name, but what can you do? <laughs> uh, is there a mic? Can I take one of those mics over there? Okay, so as I said, there's, um, we need to get actually on the ATM here. As I said, there's two ways to pop up this remote menu. One is by the gimme the loot card and the other is by a special key sequence. So let's try it. Okay, so it pops up my hidden menu there. Uh, it will let me dispense 50 notes from A, B, C or D, which are the four cassettes on the ATM. Uh, print out statistics, like I told earlier. So let's uh, just try dump 50 bills from the first cassette. So these actually are double as invites to the freak show party, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you can uh, pop up the menu by the card, but also by entering the special key sequence. <laughs> and there we go. <laughs> Okay, uh, can we go back to the computer again? <laughs> 